Uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, Ashley Carpenter, let me give a little background. So my friend, uh, who I met many, many years ago, I'm Joel McIntosh, the publisher of Proof Rock Press. I failed to, to mention that. Uh, I've been doing this 31 years, so I've had the privilege of meeting some fascinating people in the field. And one of those fascinating people is Joyce Van Tassel Vosca. She was, she started out as a teacher. She eventually uh, had her PhD. She, she moved from a, a couple of universities and landed at the College of William and Mary where she created the Center for Gifted Education. She developed a curriculum model called the Integrated Curriculum Model. It sort of is, it, it, it melds the idea of advanced curricular content with higher order processes and, and authentic products and then focuses the curriculum on larger learning concepts and, and broad issues. Uh, and, and if we've got books on the, the Integrated Curriculum Model, but that that drove what happened at College of William and Mary Center for Gifted as they developed curriculum unit after curriculum unit. They were well funded with, with uh, federal grants to look at does the curriculum that they've developed work? The answer is yes. It showed improvement among students in Title I schools. They've had a great deal of success with the curriculum that they developed. Uh, over the years, some some real, really wonderful authors, uh, Tamara Stambot of, of Vanderbilt University, uh, Catherine Little, who's now at the University of Connecticut, Bronwyn McFarland, uh, who's at the University of Arkansas, came out of her program, and they're all great authors of ours, and I'm proud to have them with us. Joyce retired a few years back, and Tracy Cross, who's an, another friend of mine, uh, took over that program, and he and his team have been part of this legacy of, of building professional learning, continuing to build curriculum uh, from the College of William and Mary, and the person whom I would like to introduce now is uh, Ashley Carpenter. Ashley is uh, an assistant professor and director of professional development and publications at the, the Center for Gifted. She received her doctoral degree from the University of Connecticut. She's a former middle school teacher, and she's also been intimately involved in a Jack Kent Cook Foundation uh, grant that's building blended curriculum uh, in Ohio. So she's got a lot of experience with the online piece as well as the curricular piece. And I thought she'd be an ideal person to bring in and, and talk about to this topic. Uh, Ashley, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for coming. Hi, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And I know you were nice enough to sort of prepare a slideshow to be able to talk about these. I think the outline that you had in mind was to talk a little bit about uh, math curriculum, reading curriculum, science curriculum, and then building online engagement. But let me do, let me take a moment before you start the slideshow, let me take a moment and show folks just a sampling of the wonderful curriculum that's coming out of the, the, the center. Um, let have, me start have with- a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. And, and I was trying to think of a cogent way to sort of share the different curriculum curriculum with the, the, the listeners. And I've, so let me just take a few. I'm just going to do some examples. Uh, out of the center is the math curriculum for gifted students. That these, these are not, um, these don't replace regular curriculum. These are extensions, they're activities, they're sort of supplementals to uh, a, a regular curriculum. Let me show the always very popular Jacob's Ladder series. The Jacob's Ladder series is one of the few uh, curricular programs shown to increase higher order thinking and uh, uh, reading performance at the, at the highest levels among kids. And that, that was shown to be true in, in Title I schools. We also have from the College of William and Mary, uh, we did a series of uh, challenging Common Core language arts units. These are all tied to those keywords within the, the Common Core standards. So the nice thing is if, if your state doesn't use the Common Core, you can still tie those keywords in there. These are all standards-based uh, standards based curriculum that, that you can use in the classroom. And then finally, I tried to lump a lot of really good curriculum uh, together. The, the project clearing units are science, and these are where we're, we're trying to, to develop um, I, th I think um, a deep understanding of science concepts in kids. And that's the, the focus of, of the Clarion units. You can go to our website. Notice on the bottom here, I've got uh, WM at ASPX. This is where you can find all of the William & Mary curriculum. Uh, thinking like a scientist is a, we, developing the habits of mind of a person in a discipline. How would you teach those habits of mind? And we do science. I mean, all of these, these are just exemplars. So like we have science, we have math, um, we have engineering. We have a lot of different books in that series. And then also there, there are just some sort of uh, math-based units as well. They weren't part of the Project Clarion, but they're, they're good solid math units that could be used in, as extensions in a regular um, 
uh, a math classroom, but could also be in a pullout program. So, you know, you've got a lot of different options, and those are just a few of the 53 uh, curriculum units that, uh, that that are from the College of William and Mary. So, Ashley, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to stop sharing it. If you'll kind of take over to share your ideas Absolutely. with the folks. It actually was challenging for me to think about. Wait, how do I how do I talk about these curriculum units in like two, three minutes each or give some strategies because I actually do, you know, day, two day long professional developments on some of these curriculum units. So I had to be very, very choosy. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Ashley Carpenter and I am the Director of Professional Development at the Center for Gifted Education at William & Mary. Uh, you already introduced me, so I don't even need to do this other than <laughs> you can look at a picture of my son. He's a cutie. Well, he used to be cuter than he is now. He was like five then, he's nine now. But um, yes. Um, I teach gifted courses at William & Mary, our endorsement series. I was a middle school science teacher for 14 years. Six of those were in a full-time gifted magnet program in Florida. Um, I have my master's in science education and yes, I, uh, my PhD from University of Connecticut, um, creativity, gifted education and talent development. And my advisor was Dr. Del Sigley. So um, my, I'm also a mom to a twice exceptional little boy. So that's my passion. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give you um, a few tips and when I was thinking through if I was in the classroom and I was using our units what would I want to know about putting it online because we're already very used to doing it in person but a lot of people they are like uh oh what do I do now right what do you do when you don't have the students sitting at tables working together collaborating and working through these things with the students so the first series um, that Joel talked about math curriculum for gifted students highlighted here um, this series really it does have um, activities and lessons um, that are aligned to those national standards. So those are based on the um, Common Core curriculum standards, but a lot of the states have adopted a version of Common Core. So even if it if um, we were just working in Florida and it is the Florida's standards, but they align, they're very similar. Um, if you don't do Common Core standards, the concepts are al aligning with many of the same grade levels. So it's designed, again, it's design designed to go beyond that general curriculum, not as a replacement. And you could use it for either a gifted pullout program or as differentiation for students who need more challenge um, and are already mastering the general education um, curriculum within the regular classroom. And so one of the things um, that really we focused on was developing the mathematical habits of mind. So when you're doing these units, we really want to, it's not do a problem, yes, you got that correct, right? Do this problem, yes, you got this correct. It's all about all of those habits of mind. So really making sense of problems and persevering to solve them. So if it didn't work one way, let's try another way. So. And then reason, reasoning, um, constructing viable arguments and critiquing others. So if you have, if the students are solving a problem and they feel that their way is founded, that they have an actual argument and they can cite the reasons why theirs is valid and also critique others and, and kind of point out to them mathematically what might possibly be a little misstep in solving those problems. Be able to model with mathematics um, use appropriate tools, um, attend to precision, and look for and make use of structure, and look for and express regularity in repeated reasoning. So again, these are not meant to have kind of like a worksheet where you just hand the child <laughs> the worksheet and say bye-bye. They really are meant to, um, you know, get the students thinking like mathematicians, I know it's the name of one of our units, but it's very true. And um, really think through it and have discussions and talk about how they're doing what they're doing. So one strategy that I thought might be very useful for online learning is I'm a big fan of curriculum compacting um, by um, Reese Renzulli and Burns. And this strategy is that you are taking students that might have already mastered the regular curriculum, the on grade level standards, okay? So one thing when you're doing online is the students have a task to do, 
right? And then they have another task to do and they have another task to do. Well, this lends itself really nicely to say, all right, what do I want my students to learn? What standard? And then pre-assessing pre them. So you could offer the first thing in your little module online could be a little quick little pretest, And that pretest could be five questions um, and it's self-graded. And if it's self-graded, the kids can very quickly see if they get a certain score that they might not really need that, that instruction that you're about to do with the rest of the class. And you can send them on a different path. That different path can be these, um, this curriculum, these units. They're very easily aligned. So students who master that can compact out. And you could even just say in the feedback, because a lot of these online class um, systems, so Canvas, Schoology, we use Blackboard. It probably is a little ancient, maybe even Google Classroom. As the students get there, you've got 85%. You could say, you know, you've tested out of this section, please skip the next two lessons and go to whatever. In my classroom, we used to always take a pretest at the beginning of a unit. I taught science. Um, if students got 85% or above, they would compact out and then they would do our extension project. I built my classroom that way so that students already knew it. It was in my syllabus. The parents knew it. But you know, there's nothing worse than students going in and practicing 20 problems, the same skill, when they already knew it the first time. So this is a good um, option. Then, You know, you, Ashley, I might yeah. also mention, too, that, that one of the nice things about the project clarion units and the, and the math units is that they all include pre-assessments already. So, you know, you can... Those are already ready for you as a teacher. And, and because you can get permission to upload those, the kids can take them. They can mm -hmm. record their entries in Google Classroom or Google Docs, you know, wherever you want to collect that information. So that, that, that upfront work is already done for you by the folks at, at, uh, at William & Mary. Sorry, I just had to mute my Alexa. Is My Alexa reminder is going off in the background. I hope you can't hear it. Anyway, so these um, lessons can very easily be helpful when you're compacting. Oh. Okay, so here's one, an example lesson. Um, this is 1.1. This is, I believe, a fifth grade um, curriculum. It's all about symbols. So it's all about all of those mathematical symbols, parentheses and brackets and um, all of those things when you're talking about algebraic thinking. Um, so this is um, having them create kind of like a number sentence, right? Taking out the parentheses, taking out the brackets, taking out all these things, keeping the numbers in line without the symbols and then giving it to a partner and having the partner figure out what symbols go where, okay? So this is one of those places where I thought it's really challenging, right? You can't have the kids sit down. You can't have them working together. How would we possibly do this? We really want the students to still be interacting with each other. So please don't be afraid to partner them up and don't be afraid to have groups. But some of the tools you might wanna use are, you could use a discussion board for this. So if you have a discussion board, post this, you could even, I did a screenshot, instead of retyping the whole thing, or even especially with um, some of the equations that you might be laborious to go ahead and retype, you could use a screenshot and post it for the students in a discussion board, and then your students would post their number sentence minus all of the symbols, and then people underneath would give their possible solutions. You could also have them write um, how they figured it out. Um, some of them have video components where you might want to have them recording themselves explaining how they figured it out. Um, they could use a whiteboard. I have here live meetings. If you are doing live meetings, you can also do breakout rooms. I know that in Zoom and in WebEx, um, there's a breakout room feature. So that means you would possibly put the three children who are, you know, curriculum compacted in a group over, um, you know, in a separate room, and then they can actually discuss live uh, their problem solving um, technique. You can also use the annotate feature. So if you post something up while you're doing a live lesson, if you're gonna do this with your entire gifted classroom or your pullout, you could put up a number sentence and then have students, you, they click the annotate button and then they can draw on the screen the symbols. 
I know people are scared of that annotate feature because they're worried students are going to do something inappropriate. <laughs> That's all the <laughs> Zoom bombing that has been going on, but it really can be used in um, a good way. You can always turn it off. You can always clear somebody and you can always make sure you know who's um, drawing what on what example. Another thing you could use is whiteboards. If you're worried about the little ones typing out their math, you can use whiteboards and they can always solve the problems on the whiteboards and you can always have them show it. Just make sure they turn their mirroring off. That's something that we um, realized if you're showing it might be backwards. That's probably because their mirroring is on on their camera and that's just a setting within Zoom or Teams or WebEx. So, so those are some ways that you can get students to be solving the problems, still working together, still having discourse and discussions. Um, while using some of the problems. Okay. Another thing I want to talk about is math equations online. So some of the things that scare teachers are how are students going to be typing math equations, right? They can barely type letters. How are they going to do math equations? Um, one of the things that you should know is that Microsoft actually has an equation feature. Did you know that? I didn't know that <laughs> until one of my math teachers taught me. But in Microsoft, if you go to insert, um, you look over to the right and it actually has equation and it has all of the symbols that you could possibly use. So you could teach your children how to do that, your students. Another thing you could use is you could create a math symbols guide. So this might be a Word document or a Google Docs where you put in all the different symbols and the students can then copy and paste into their online classroom. That means they don't have to go find it. They don't have to be like, where is it on the keyboard? Um, they don't have to find anything. They can use it as a, as a template. The other thing that I really recommend, especially when people are explaining their thinking, is allow students to use talk to text in their explaining. We want them to explain, and some of our students, they're really good at telling you, but they're not good at writing it because it takes so much energy and so much time for them to write that down. So teach them the tool of talk to text. So you can enable it in Word, you can enable it in Google, in Google, um, why can't I think of it, Docs. It's just a little microphone. And if you were just to have a little prompt of explain your thinking, they could then, you know, hit the microphone, explain how they solved it, and then copy it and paste it in. So then they're focusing on the math and not necessarily focusing on that, that writing. It takes a, done so long. That's a great idea. Anything yeah. out that it ends up no longer being about the topic anymore. And it ends up really being about how do I spell this? How do I type this? <laughs> right? Like, where does the period go? What's capital letter? So that takes that all out of um, the mix. We, we had that same issue with my, my uh, well, now seventh grader going into second grade and in first grade, he just, he struggles like he's slow at writing at this oh, stage yeah. he just so doesn't have the son. mechanical That's skills biggest and, problem and, and some of those real smart girls in that classroom were way ahead of you and he would look around and he was just like he did he he is incredibly smart at math but he he got the attitude that like oh, i must not be very good at math because i can't write out the answers and I, yeah. this new this this year this first the second grade teacher that we have has been much like encouraging him to answer the questions orally online and, and he's just zooming through this stuff it's just fantastic so yeah absolutely if we can like let kids i think that was a great idea thanks for sharing that one sure it's legitimately saved <laughs> our education uh, my son's going into fourth grade he really, um, in second grade, when they stopped doing a lot of verbal and a lot of drawing and went into writing everything all day, it became such a barrier for him that he started just avoiding and fighting everybody about everything. So we really figured out that if, he, if he's going to tell you something, he can go into so much detail and talk for 10 minutes. If you ask him to write, he's going to do three words. So let's just, let's take it out <laughs> when we don't need it, right? When you're, when you're practicing writing, that's different. But when you're doing math or science or um, reading comprehension, let's just take that barrier down. Okay. All right, let's talk about reading. So the next one is Jacob's Ladder. Uh, again, this is a series. It is reading comprehension for advanced learners. Uh, and the way Jacob, Jacob's Ladder it works is there's a bunch of different texts or reading selections, and they are standalone. 
um, you could just pull one out and use that. Um, and there are, there are a series of ladders or ladders are uh, question sets that go up in the um, thinking level, the, the, you know, critical creative thinking um, as you go up the ladders. So some of them have one ladder, some of them have two, some of them can use options, but the ladders are here, you know, ladder A would be like sequencing, cause and effect, consequences and implications. Then ladder B would go from details and then you use those details to classify and then you use those classifications to generalize. Ladder C, looking for elements within the text. I say text, it's it's a poem or a, or a story or, you know, it's not actually a book. Um, a full novel or something. Um, then elements go into inferences and then taking those inferences to connect that theme or that concept. So the thinking level is always going up. As you go up the ladder, the challenge is going up. And then ladder D, synthesis, summarizing, paraphrasing. There are other ladders, but within um, the original series, um, three to five, this is where it is. So um, here is a example. Um, from grade level three, the ant and the dove. Um, so you can see this is one of Aesop's fables. Um, and you can see the ladders that go along with that. It starts by list the events in order as they occur. There are several cause and effect relationships. What's the cause? What's the effect? And what are the overall consequences? So again, like I mentioned in math, this isn't meant to be a worksheet. It's not a, here you go, <laughs> do this. The point is we want to, we really want to encourage thinking. We really want to encourage thinking. We really want to encourage discourse and conversation and supporting your point of view. Um, so again, how do we do that? Well, the process is supposed to be that the reading, the students read the text. Now in the lower grades, the teacher can read the text to the students as well, right? or they can read in pairs and then the students think they use the brainstorming sheet that is within the unit to respond to those ladder, which is the questions, the set of three questions, and then they discuss. And the students in class have a discussion that's focusing on those, those ladder questions, okay? So this is the process. The process repeats each time you have um, a reading. So, what you really miss when you're online are, are, is that discussion and the teacher's ability to probe. So one thing that I have here for you is some different probing questions. And one thing that you can do is you can make little PDFs of these probing questions and you can give them to the students. So if the students are discussing, sometimes they're like, okay, I asked you a question, <laughs> you say what it is and I have nothing to say because we haven't taught them how to discuss. So teach them to use these and pick one and they can either type it in their discussion box to keep that discussion going, right? Or here, I'll just keep going. So they can say, that's interesting. Do you have a different idea or does anyone have a different idea? And that class can keep, you know, adding to that discussion. Um, the teacher can use this within a Zoom classroom. They also, if they're in pairs or threes in a, in a, um, what's it called? In a breakout room, they can, this can help to get the conversation to keep it going. Um, so they can use it as a template or teachers can also use it. So if we teach our children how to probe, um, they will also have that benefit. So Actually, I'm really, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the, the things that um, I think can happen if, if you, if there's, you know, Jacob's Ladder is activities, right? And, but mm -hmm. then there's a, a lot of good upfront matter that talks about how the, 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 best practices were established with this material and how this material can, you know, show the, the kind of read, advanced reading skills gains, but that what the way you get there is through these extension questions. You know, if you, if you just sort of let kids fill in the blank or whatever, and that's just, that's the end of it. If, if they just treat it like a, with the kids treat it just like a, any other worksheet or something, it doesn't, it doesn't perform like it does when you've got a dynamic discussion. And, and that, that could be an oral discussion with a group of folks, or mm -hmm. uh, it could also be, you know, in Google Docs, a collaborative worksheet where the kid's putting in an answer and the teacher comes in and uses these, you know, kind of questions that you're mm -hmm. posing here. But I, I do want to encourage everybody to think about that, that, that Jacob's Ladder is not a system of, of worksheet. It is a yeah. foundation for rich discussion in the classroom. Right. Yes. Um, so, but they can, you can also use them with students if the teacher's not available, if you're online and there's 
the other thing is with Jacob's Ladder is that you can pre-test, pre-assess, and you can determine the level where the students are, and you can give the same story to all the students, and you can give different ladders to the students. So you can always group them by what ladder um, they're working with. So if you're not going to do a whole group, if you give them these sentence starters, sometimes kids just don't know how to have academic discourse. And so giving them this, I agree with you because, and they fill in the blank, or I have a different idea blank because that helps them to, to um, learn how to have an academic conversation, right? Not just, oh yeah, I like what you said. We want to try to get them to, you know, try to validate their point with evidence or, you know, really push people's understanding um, uh, of the concepts that are going on and why they chose. Because yes, the details might be a right or wrong answer if you're asking them to list the details. But once you go up in the ladder, they're not right or wrong. It's, it's, a, it's viewpoints. It's your thinking. It's how did you connect these different ideas? Um, and how are you going to justify that point? So, okay. And then when, if we're talking about online or blended, so we do have a couple schools in Virginia here that are going 50% online, 50% um, in person. So, you know, what would you do online and what would you do in person? So if you have an in-person component, I would absolutely say, please model this process in the classroom as a whole class with the teacher reading, everybody reading it together everybody reading the ladder together, you know, pr prompting them of how to use the tools in person, um, helping to facilitate the discussion. I don't know how they're going to do that six feet apart, but right. Um, they might do it with a whiteboard. Maybe they'll have a silent conversation with a whiteboard or something. Um, or even they might have computers and they might facilitate the online discussion, right? Silently online, but in their classroom. So the teacher can really do the modeling. Um, it, we don't ever recommend that you hand the, 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 the story and the questions to the students and just let them go. Please model the process. Online though, once you model the process, you know, you can give them the readings to read on their own. You can give them the brainstorming sheets. Um, you can give them a time to form their points and answer the questions and cite their evidence and do all that thinking. Um, and if you have the opportunity to have an in-person discussion, that would be what I would do in person. So. I don't know how many people are online. I don't know how many people are, uh, you know, in person, but that's my suggestion. Okay. My topics, my favorite topics are science. So um, these are probably, I would say my favorite units. Um, I'm a science teacher. I was a middle school science teacher, but I really love um, doing professional developments on the Clarion um, elementary science units. So these units are very inquiry driven. Um, there's two different models. So all of, all of these are based on the integrated curriculum model. There is each one focuses on the specific science content. So plants or weather or matter or invention, that one, I love that one. Um, and then there is an overarching concept. So it's either systems or change. Those are the two options. And then scientific processes. So thinking like a scientist, how would a scientist go about tackling this? Uh, so one of the, there's a problem, there's problem-based units where you're going through an actual problem, like a scenario. And then there's really inquiry-based units where it's all about students touching, feeling, smelling, playing with, and getting all those experiences through actual experiential learning. So that's part of the problem when we talk about online, right? How do we do science online? Well, we really want to encourage at-home inquiry. And one of the great things about these units is pretty much almost all of the what quote unquote experiments, they're not really experiments, they're more inquiry-driven experiences. They use a lot of common household items. So that's good, right? So um, we want to encourage how does a scientist make observations? How, how would they learn more? How would they conduct an experiment? you know, how would they tell others what they found out? And we want them to learn this through exploring and observing and um, touching and playing. So one thing, if you have a unit already and it tells you to use a certain item, 
and you don't think that those students have those items readily available, it's okay to change it. Don't be afraid to change it. So here's an example. One of the lessons in, um, I don't remember which one this is. <laughs> it's on change, but it's all about observing change, right? And it tells you to use an orange, right? And they're gonna observe the orange. Lots of kids have oranges, right? But what if mom and dad didn't buy oranges? They can use something else. You can use popcorn, right? Popping popcorn. You could use a banana. Like it doesn't have to be an orange, right? Um, so, so be flexible. Try to see what else you could use. But, you know, there's a lot of matter ones have ice, right? Ice and water. The ones with plants, they use seeds. If you're not going to mail your students seeds, have teach them this experience of they can get seeds on their own you know where they can get seeds they can get seeds from their vegetables if they buy a pepper have them save the pepper seeds <laughs> dry them out right put them in a plastic baggie with some water here i'll show you guys there you go so put them in a um put them in a plastic baggie with a wet paper towel and then they can see the seeds germinate and they have seeds. So they can do this with um, green beans, the beans inside, they can do it with peas, they can do it with any, if they have lima beans, if they have pinto beans that are dried, you know, so a lot of people have those in their cabinet, they can take a pepper, um, they can take, what is, a cucumber seed, um, an apple, apple's probably going to take a long time, <laughs> but there's some seeds that will um, dry out, a spaghetti squash, a watermelon, um, all of these fruits and vegetables that they bring home and are eating anyway, they can harvest those seeds, dry them out and use them. Um, and then they can watch them grow. So this is one of the units has a lot of, um, you know, building um, little, it's called a mini greenhouse. Um, and then observing how different sunlight, different water, different soil um, affects the different plants. But so if you have, if you have a little stopping point where, you know, you're worried about access think outside the box, change it up. It doesn't have to be exactly what we, the authors, um, not myself, but the author said, think about what you're trying to get out of the activity and then improvise. You can always do demonstrations online, but they're not as, they're not as meaningful. You could always demo it with your video and then have the students go try it. Obviously don't have them do anything that's dangerous. Like there's one, the cloud one is, has a match um, it, the, with meteorologists. Yes. With, um, the meteorologist unit, obviously have parents do that one, but it's super cool. As long as they can experience it themselves, they're going to be, they're going to be happy. They're going to be engaged and they're going to be thinking like scientists. Okay. I just have a few. I don't work for any of these companies, by the way, I'm a public servant for this, the Commonwealth of Virginia, but so there's some ways you can increase engagement with some free tools that I've seen educators using. One, I really like Nearpod. Um, it's free for teachers. Uh, it's just a way to, if you have kind of like, a, if you teach by PowerPoint and you're talking like a little head like me in the side, this is just a way that you can add interactive um, things. So there's a, you can add interactive videos, you can add collaborate, which is where they can kind of put up a little sticky note with a picture and a comment. Um, you can take polls, you can do little, um, you know, challenge quizzes, which have them climbing a mountain. Um, you can do open-ended questions where they're typing into it, multiple choice questions, and then matching. What it does is it takes your presentation and it just adds in these little, like as slides, as interactive slides. So that was something we used for our camp launch, which is an, uh, we did an online camp for gifted um, students um, of poverty this um, this summer and we use this resource. So that was pretty cool. The other one's Flipgrid. And I had never heard about Flipgrid until my son's teacher used it, but it is a way to get video engagement. Um, they can use their phones, they can use the computer. Um, it's just a way for online discussions you can use it for. The teacher would go up and it's like a very quick snippet, right? And she would ask a question and then all the different kids would respond with their own little videos. And you can also comment on each other's videos, like them, and they don't all have to be there at the same time. So it's like this ongoing discussion, kind of like a discussion forum, but through video. 
um, they can continue on for weeks and weeks and weeks. But so that was a, a resource that my son's teacher used that he really enjoyed because he could actually see everybody's faces, but it wasn't that whole zoom and mute yourselves and can't talk and everybody gets to talk one time, one, once at a time. So taking turns and then ask for feedback from your students. It's one I think as teachers, we often forget. Um, you ask them what they like, ask them what, how they learn best in an online way. And if they don't like something and they're not learning from it, ask them what they would like and they might give you a really good idea. So don't be afraid to get feedback from the children. Okay, I'm gonna do my pl plug plug here, Joel. Sure. <laughs> uh, Center for Gifted Education, um, just in case you don't know anything about us, we are a research and development center. A lot of people know us for our curriculum, but that's not actually all we do. Um, we offer professional development. That's what I do. I do uh, conferences. I do customized trainings. I go out to school district. Well, not anymore. I will zoom into your school district and do trainings on any of these unit series for you, whatever you would like. We customize it to what your district or school needs. We have K-12 programs for students, which actually are going to be coming out online this year. So look for those. We do research um, and we also have graduate programs. We have an executive EDD in um, educational leadership with a concentration in gifted education. And we also have a endorsement program for the state of Virginia. There's our website. And some of the conferences that are coming up is we have our twice exceptional conference. Our first one was last year. We're gonna continue again this year and it is most likely gonna be online. We have our national curriculum conference that is most likely gonna be online also. And then we also offer um, AP uh, Summer Institute. So that's the Advanced Placement Summer Institute um, three weeks during the summer. So that's all about us. Yeah, you can always Thank go you, to Ashley. cfge wm.edu and all information is on our website. Very good, very good. Let me uh, grab the screen back and, and sure. uh, tell everybody, uh, uh, please, I'm, I'm gonna do a little spiel here, uh, like Ashley just did, but <laughs> for these curricular units, uh, but then we're gonna get to the Q&A. So it, as this has been you know, progressing, I've, I, there's lots of good questions, but please go in there and add any additional questions while I show you guys a few uh, additional items. If, you're, if you joined us a little late, I wanna reiterate, uh, that we will post uh, a recording of this uh, webinar and we will also send out uh, certificates of attendance. Let me get over to the, the Proofrock website and I'll, I need to launch. Uh, sorry, I must have I closed my browser. Let me launch the, the site. There we go. So I can show you guys how to get to all of our curriculum. One of the things that I want to show is, you know, we've, we have uh, my goodness, we, we have uh, uh, s several thousand books that we, that we sell, and we, we always sort of grapple with how do we make search work. So obviously search works here. So if you're looking for any of the units that, that uh, you know, that we've mentioned today, please just type in the name here. But let me show you a little trick. Let's say I'm a science teacher and I want K through two curriculum units. Okay, it's very easy to generate here um, on the website, and then you will see budding botanist, for example. That's is one of the what I was talking areas. about with the yep. seeds. Yep. 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 So uh, it, it, we've got lots of materials now. Obviously, and, and I'm responding directly to a question that came up mm -hmm. because you know traditionally gifted programs tended to get started at grade three. Now that's changing over time, but the, we do have a lot of materials in three, four, or five. You know, but we've been working over the last few years trying to build out some of those the curriculum for younger uh, younger kids, and we have quite a quite a bit of good stuff. So you know, feel free to pick your discipline, then go in and look at the grade levels and and find materials that work for you. All of the materials that Ashley is talking about are here, Advanced Gifted Curriculum, down here, William and Mary units, okay? You'll find everything that you need there. Also, if you just wanna go directly to the Jacobs Ladder Advanced Reading Series, uh, you can just go to this uh, little thing here. So there's lots of ways to navigate through our website uh, to find the materials you want. Oh, Joel, I, do wanna, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't mention it, but you can also get student guides and mail them home to your students if you want them to have the student version of like a mini workbook for, for uh, Jacob's Ladder too. That's right. That's exactly yeah. right. It just popped up on the screen. I was like, oh, I forgot to mention. Uh, <laughs> right, right. 
that's and that's why some people are using them. I've had some districts buy the workbooks and then they they send them to the kids for for use at home if they if they didn't set up the forms in Google Docs or whatever. I I did want to go and mention one last time. We are here to help you. If you own one of these books and you want to be able to you know take a picture with your phone and then upload that into your uh, student information system or, or learning management system, please come over here and talk to us. We're if you own the book, we will do that for you uh, for for at no cost. We'll set up a licensing agreement so that we can. Uh, give you the permission you need. If you need a whole unprotected PDF that we're going to have to watermark and some things like that, that there's a there's a smaller discounted fee uh, associated with that. And then if you're an institution that needs, you know, 35 copies, and we'll sell you a licensing agreement for that. But but please know if you're a customer who's bought one of these books and wants to use it with your kids, we will license that to you at at no cost so that you can use it uh, in your system. Just click this permissions homepage and and uh, uh, we're here to help. Stephanie, why don't you take over a little bit with the, the questions that we've had? Yeah, sure thing. Okay, uh, so kind of building off what Joel was talking about with uh, us developing more of those K2 resources. Uh, Ashley, do you have any favorites from the, the Clarion units that you would want to mention well, that are I for those younger say, grades? So it, or is that this is a question we're asking for there's grade three and up, but struggle with K2, especially mm -hmm. for science. The only reason I would say the only reason that those grade levels are on there is because of the reading level and the amount of writing. The content, you can take any of those units. And if you're going to change it anyway to put it online, you can change the reading level and put it down. Like if you want to just talk those questions <laughs> instead of writing them, if, because um, then you can adapt them, the content, the activities, the questions down to K2, any of them. It really is just if you're going to have the students looking at the actual worksheet and they, if they're not in, you know, for, if they can't read a, at a fourth grade reading level, that's what's going to stop them. Or you can adapt it to, they don't have to write. Like there's a lot of writing, the, the, as, as you go up in the grade levels, there's a lot more writing. So you can take that out. They don't have to write it. They can draw a picture. <laughs> they can talk, right? They can just discuss. Um, so Feel free to use any of them. Just adapt the reading and writing levels. The content is all accessible. Oh, great, that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so second question here, what advice would you give to a first year teacher who will teach fourth grade gifted students remotely? Um, and I guess this could go for general first year advice too. Love on them. Just, <laughs> you know what, number one thing guys is that curriculum aside, um, as long as they know that you really care about them and you are there for them to be engaged and learning and supported, that's, that really is the, the biggest deal. Because I'm going to tell you from a parent's perspective, my son does not care what he's learning. He cares that his teacher's there smiling and he's going to learn something. He doesn't really, he doesn't really care what it is. Um, Every, understand that they are different. Gifted children are different. They are quirky. Um, they just need, they just need to learn their own strengths and um, yeah, and people to understand them and have, have their own little tribe. So. Well, and, and the other thing to know if you're a first year teacher in the middle of all this is that the rest of your career is all downhill. It's <laughs> this is get the easiest hard. year <laughs> you will ever, have, or the hardest year. Hardest year, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'll all be good after this. <laughs> and you know what? Everybody's figuring it out. Everybody, a lot of people are having like their first year this year who have taught for 20 years, who have never taught in an online platform. Um, yeah, engagement, 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 and um, as long as the kids are are learning and happy and yeah, you'll be good. Great. Um, we had a question about, uh, let's see, if you teach the Common Core fifth grade math curriculum to fourth grade students, what book should you uh, go for? What book of extensions is the best one? I so, would say fifth, whatever, if it, what, because it's gonna align more to the fifth grade Common Core standards, um, yeah, topics. Right. All right. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and I think this question was relating to the thinking like an engineer, thinking like a scientist books, uh, but it's about habits of mind. 
Um, are these habits of mind designed to move against siloed content? Are they doing some of the work of teaching for creativity? Look, can, um, Ashley, can I jump in with that mm -hmm. one? Because it's it's kind of a, a special one for me because we've worked right. so so hard to build content on this topic. So one of the principles in gifted education is that instead of learning about a discipline, you learn to do the discipline. Mm -hmm. And so you you develop the habits of mind of a scientist. You develop the pr the practices of a scientist that you're essentially as a child modeling the kind of behavior that a scientist does in, in the classroom. So a lot of the materials that we've developed allow kids to do the discipline in an authentic way. And, and that's really more what these kind of materials are getting to. And, and we, we, we've been committed to building out a lot of stuff like that. Uh, so that series was part of that. But Ashley, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that was something yeah. I, I felt good about, you know. Um, I agree. Um, those habits of mind are specifically the math, and that's just something that I, in my personal opinion, just going through math curriculum um, for, for a district um, that the regular math text has a lot of habits of mind, but they state them and they don't necessarily practice them throughout the practice. Like the problems don't go along with like if you're just you like solve these 35 equations you're not really doing any of the habits of mind. Um, so it does have to be an active an active goal of the teacher when looking at problems and the problems in our units um, give, give a little more opportunity for those habits of mind, I would say, than just here's a worksheet, do these practice problems that are probably very, a um, little bit lower level um, thinking, mm -hmm. so. Great, that makes sense. Um, and I'm not positive of the context of this question, but I wanted to check. Um, so this person was asking, is there an expansive definition of text here? Are there places where, for example, scientific diagrams or mathematical proofs or historical documents are used as the text? So I didn't know if that was like for what you use in an LMS or if that's for the uh, materials in the books. This, when I was talking about text, I'm only talking about Jacob's Ladder because okay. Jacob's Ladder has um, different, let's say, reading options. Um, they're, they're either poems for the original series. There's now Jacob's Ladder has expanded, but for the original reading comprehension, there are poems, there are short stories, there are Aesop's fables. Um, in the affective um, that Joyce and um, Tamara are going to talk about tomorrow. There are there's more stories about, you know, students interacting and things like that. So yeah, it's more social emotional right. kind of reading. So um, I believe you can go on and look at for samples in all of our units. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can click on if you click on the picture on the website, it'll say take you here. The science units don't have text. It's all lessons and um, prompts and questions and diagrams um, and activities and math doesn't have they don't have it doesn't have readings either so the only readings I was talking about is Jacob's Ladder. Great great let me let me kind of pull back the the attention here and I, I can real quickly answer the, the the last questions and because we're running out of time <laughs> uh, <laughs> one, one wasn't a question but it was a great idea that old cd cases work great for growing seeds Thank too you. so that, that was a great great comment i don't really um, have a lot of those <laughs> yeah right i know i only have plastic bags <laughs> um, one was about the challenging common core language arts what's what what content is in those if you go to those those product pages click on the the, the cover okay we, we have a, 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 examples from the table of contents you can see exactly what what materials are in there you can also look at some sample activity that that's in the book so there's there's quite a few of like essentially look inside the book kind of stuff that we have on our website and finally the last question that I I'll be able to address is has to do with the student workbooks we developed a series of student workbooks to go with the math uh, materials and the Jacobs ladder series as a convenience they normally kids would write the answers down on a piece of notebook paper or it would be in the middle of a discussion but some some teachers they are completely optional. Some teachers like to have the convenience of the booklet where they their you know student answers are recorded. So we provide those, but they're not necessary. They're they're entirely optional. And I would suggest that an electronic version of that 
workbook would be um, wouldn't be effective. You should you should take those over to Google Docs and have the kids put the answers in there uh, because you're just going to get a PDF that the kid it, it would just add a lot of complexity to the thing. You don't you don't uh, you better off with a collaborative writing environment uh, for that kind of thing. So uh, there we go. Let me let me share Ashley's contact information. Uh, and if you will, I'll only be able to leave this up for, you know, just a little bit here. Mm -hmm. But if you take a screenshot, it gives her email address and the, the address of the um, uh, the center there. And you're always welcome to reach out to her about the programs that they they offer at the center. And uh, uh, so, you know, grab that that screenshot there if, for her contact information. And it, yeah, okay. my email is a y carpenter. My middle name is York. There you go. Ah, so, a y carpenter. Yeah, and that's that was on there. I got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> people, okay. people are like, what? What is that y doing there? Why? Ah, that makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, Ashley, uh, thank you so much for, mm -hmm. for coming in and sharing about these great products. And Stephanie, thank you for handling the, the Q&A piece of, of this. And uh, thank you, both of you, for being here. I think, th Ashley, thank you for your time. It's just been wonderful of you. Of course. I always, I always have fun. So. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.